probably be helpful to put myself on screen. Whoops. Anyway, you guys just heard everything. Well, let's start this over. Here we go. Uh, today in episode uh, 108 of the Redman Group, uh, we have Dr. Warren Farrell, special guest for the entire show. Uh, I'm Anthony Dream Johnson, founder of the 21 Convention, CEO of the Redman Group, co-founder of the Redman Group, and CEO of 21 Studios. So joining me on today's show is Dr. Warren Farrell, author of The Boy Crisis. He's also the author of The Myth of Mel Power and over 17, or many books published in over 17 languages around the world. Without further ado, please welcome to the show, Dr. Warren Farrell. Glad to be with you. Yeah, glad to have you, man. I'm really excited. We first Thank talked, you. Uh, you know, a few months ago in uh, late 2019, and yes. real pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it, Anthony. Yeah. And so for you guys watching, uh, make sure to get pick up his book on Amazon. Link is in the description. There's an audible copy you can get for free by using the uh, trial they have there. And this is the paperback I have. I think it's a hardback too, I believe. Yes, there is. The, the, actually, the part, the one that I probably most recommend is the audible. A lot of men especially um, really like listening to it on the way to work or you know, at the gym or that type of thing. Yeah. So my first question, I have about 57 questions for you in my little notepad here. Um, I've been digging through your book past couple weeks, and uh, like I mentioned to you before we went live, I've heard your your work, and particularly the myth of male power, uh, referenced to me hundreds of times. Um, I mean that literally, and both on the internet, podcast, as well as on my conference, people mention it over and over again. But my first question is kind of personal, and you're different from a different generation than me. Um, you said you're turning 77 here in a few days. Yeah. I, 57, give or, give or take 20 years. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> So my first question, though, is, you know, I grew up in America. I was born in the late 80s, and I grew up basically in the 90s as a child. What was it like growing up in America as a boy in your generation and your time? Well, yeah, really interesting. Um, yes, and I, I am 76 today and 77 next week. So you're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, yeah, and so therefore, doing the math, um, I grew up in high school in the um, McCarthy era. And mm -hmm. I got in tr my first way of getting in trouble was to uh, speak around the school, um, uh, and this is eighth grade now, uh, about the fact that, well, wait a minute, shouldn't we be listening to the perspectives of the Russians as well as us? And it was looked at like, you know, not just by the students, they didn't really know that much at eighth grade, yeah. um, but, but the, the teachers like, what's wrong with you? Do you come from communist parents? You know, is uh, so that my parents were conservative, um, you know, they wrote, voted Republican, Eisenhower. And so, um, but I went shortly after that, when I got in, into the ninth grade, uh, my father got a job offer in Holland and so the family moved to the Netherlands and the, to The Hague. And um, there um, I started talking about some of these issues. And it was like, a, you know, everybody was nonplussed. It was like, yeah, uh, everybody knows that the two bullies in the, in, the, in the world are the Soviet Union and the United States. They're six of one, half a dozen of the other. They just have different ideologies, um, yeah. but they're the same self-righteous personalities. And nobody listens to anybody. And so I think that that probably planted my first seed as to feeling that there was a need to be listening to somebody other than ourselves. But I was rejected and ostracized for that at a mild level. And then, uh, but when I got over to the Netherlands, it was like, yeah, of course. And so I began to, to, to tap into, well, maybe my thinking is not so strange, so, um, you know, out of... Uh, ridiculous, uh, infantile, naive, um, you know, that type of thing. And so um, I began to have a little bit of faith that I had something to pot potentially offer. Um, yeah. and, and that particularly what I had to offer was not an ideology that is communism is better or capitalism is better, um, but rather um, the ability to listen to a different perspective other than my own. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's interesting to hear that you've been speaking up since such a young age. Uh, you know, topic aside, it sounds like you've been you've been a troublemaker since you were very young. Yeah, that's. Yep. Uh, I guess you could, in a way, say that. And I never. <laughs> you know, this is. You know, anyone that knows my personality knows that. Um, you know, I'm really a, inherently I'm more of a diplomat than anything else, and I'm you know yeah. sort of very tuned into little nuances that pe that people have, and and uh, you'll probably see a lot of this in the show, and uh, the uh, and so, uh, but. 
I do have this very strong feeling like there's certain things that are unfair and that you can do one of two things with that are with things that are unfair. You can either keep them to yourself or you can speak up about them. And to me, when I see something that's unfair, that's destructive to a group of people, uh, then I feel there's a moral obligation if I feel like I could be of help to the advancement of understanding of that group of people. Um, then I feel that there's a moral obligation, not just to shut up, but to speak up. Yeah. Hell yeah. And so would you say this experience when you're young, did that foreshadow what happened later with the Feminist Now organization? Because I was reading um, today in your bio, you're, you're, I think you're the only man in American history to be elected three times to a, the Now organization uh, for feminism. That was back in the 1970s. The Board of Now in New York City, yes. Um, it was not the entire Now chapter, but the New York City okay. chapter of Now. And yeah. so the, um, uh, yes, that, that is accurate. Um, and and um, uh, so what happened there um, was I was doing my doctoral dissertation in political science and the women's movement surfaced. And so I went to my doctoral committee and I said, uh, and my, my students at Rutgers University were saying, you know, Dr. Farrell, when you talk about the women's movement, you have fire in your belly. Is that what you're doing your dissertation on? No, I was doing it on politics of grants and aids. And they said, you got to do your dissertation on uh, on the women's movement. And so I went to my uh, doctoral committee, suggested that. And they said, oh, Warren, you know, you, you're you a really good student here. You don't want to waste your time on a fad. It's going to be gone by the time you're finished your dissertation. Wow. I said, I, dis I, said, I disagree. Uh, I think yep. that what's, ha what's happened here is that we've moved from a survival-based culture uh, where women and men had to have rigid roles. Women raised children, men raised money, and both sexes were restricted and confined. And we're now, for the first time in history, um, getting up an, an, enough of the survival that in, that in countries where there's uh, a mastery of survival for at least the middle and upper middle class, the rules are going to change. And they're going to be saying, women, you can have more freedom to be whoever you want to be. And where I made my mistake was saying, and they'll be saying, man, you'll have more freedom to be whatever you want to be. The woman yeah. part turned out to be very visionary and 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 um, you know and accurate. Uh, the man part took a lot longer to happen. And I did eventually understand why it took a lot longer to happen because we are biologically invested in having men be disposable and therefore um, and to be our. It's, we call men heroes when they're willing to die for us. Uh, very few people want to give up protection, um, but the feminist movement made a fundamental mistake, and I am part of this uh, mistake, so I'm not sort of blaming them, I'm blaming us um, or holding us accountable. And that mistake was that, um, that, that we grew out of the uh, civil rights movement, and the civil rights movement clearly had a hierarchical arrangement, and the arrangement was um, uh, slave owners and slave and slaves, clearly hierarchical. And then the feminist movement was very much oriented in in Lenin and um, Marx, um, and believing that there there was the oppressor class, and there was the oppressed, the um, the owners, the workers. Um, and so clearly, uh, the people that earned money, the people that didn't earn that much money. So at a glance, it looked like men were the equivalent of the slave owners, the owner class, because on average we made more money. Um, but what was missing, and sometimes we made more money for the same work, and that is real discrimination. And then what's left of that, um, I will always fight against. Um, but what was missing from our feminist thinking was that, yes, it wasn't actually men that earned money, more money than women. For the most part, with exceptions, it was dads who earned more money than moms. That when men and women became dads and moms, men tended to give up jobs that were fulfilling, like teaching in an elementary school, and said, okay, teaching doesn't pay enough. I've got to become a salesperson of whatever. And then if they were a salesperson locally, if they had a two or three children, they realized that they should take that job to be the national salesperson because it'll pay twice as much. But that created the father's catch-22. And the father's catch-22 is that men learn to love their family by being away from the love of their family. Which and they didn't complain about it because that was what they felt made them a hero. That's what they felt made them a provider. That's what they felt made them valuable as a man. But what we as the feminist movement did is we took that increased amount of money that men made from male sacrifice to um, give up something they love, like being a musician, an artist, a writer, and um, 
and which were the fulfilling occupations almost invariably earn less money because more people want to do fulfilling op occupations um, and really and so the supply of people wanting to do fulfilling occupations is enormous the demand is much smaller uh, we yeah. all need our we all need our garbage picked up a lot more than we need a lesson in art history tradesmen um, basically yeah what's that yes and so yeah. um so what we as what we as feminists missed is we took that additional amount of money that men felt obligated to make um, and didn't realize that we had defined male power as feeling obligated to earn money that often someone else spent while we died sooner and we learned to call that power and we called that power and we called that privilege and we call that entitlement yep. when in fact it was the opposite of privilege and entitlement it was fulfilling our responsibilities and obligations and it was giving up the privilege to be the musician the privilege to be the elementary school teacher the artist the writer my own dad said to me when i when i was uh, in high school i began to show some interest and in, i think a little gift in writing and so um and my dad always fought me every time i wanted to go to the library to write my first book in high school um he said you know you got to finish um um you know weeding the garden moving these rocks with me you know doing these things and he said warren i need to teach you how to work and besides if you want to you know if you ever want to get married um if you want to be a writer um, only about one out of a hundred writers get published and almost all the and the average amount of money that a writer makes on a book is about five thousand dollars it was less than that at that time yeah. and so he said if you if you can't find a publisher you'll never find a wife for him. um and so and, and then yeah. he that seemed to work out pretty well for you yeah, yeah it worked out okay yeah. yes but not yeah. without you know not without you know it, it's gone up and down you know when yeah. i it worked out extremely well when I was speaking from the feminist perspective. As soon as I started writing and integrating men's perspectives, um, I went from, I, I've probably lost well over $20 million um, um, from the difference between what I was making when I was speaking only as a representative of the board of the National Organization for Women in New York City versus um, speaking uh, much more empathetically toward men as well. Yeah. And and never and never giving up my support for women. And, you know, the, and anyone that discriminates against women, if I'm in a crowd of um, of um, men's issues people and they're sort of putting women down, they I sound like the the group feminist. And so yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that feminists today. I'm sure they, uh, you know, to put it bluntly, they they mostly hate you or despise you. But you still speak up on behalf of women's issues and issues for girls too. And you make that very clear at the beginning of the book. Yes, and, and I hope throughout the book, um, because sometimes people make things clear at the beginning of yeah. a book like The Boy Crisis, and then they, they, they you know, I, I, me, Mr. Fair, and then, you know, then you watch the subtleties of the, of the way they weave things throughout. And so I hope yeah. that I weave that empathy for women and girls' issues um, and, and adding boys and men's issues. Um, I, from my perspective, we're all in the same family boat. And when, when only one sex wins, both sexes lose. And so uh, we're we're all in this together. Yeah, it's actually something I want to talk to you about later in the show. Uh, let's talk about it right now, though. So that that statement you just said, when when only one sex win, or I have the quote written down, but we did exactly what you just said. Yeah, when um, only one. This this is yeah. the only quote that I remember from what I wrote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I, already had, I had it written down uh, verbatim here, but I agree with you on that. Uh, the sexes are complementary; they're made for each other, and they they win together. Yes. However, yes, there are some people in the men's community, the manosphere, that disagree with you on that. They have the opposite sayings, such as, uh, for one sex, basically one sex has to sacrifice their sexual imperative uh, for the other one to win. So it's a win-lose uh, kind of thing. For one, Basically, for one sex to win, the other has to lose. I think it's a very negative and non-factual assessment of human life. But you have the yes, opposite, and I agree with you on that. If it was negative and factual, I'd go along with it because I don't. Sure, you know, sure. But it's it is negative um, and completely the opposite of the truth. I mean, you yeah. you know, I, I guess a, a good story that way to really um, create a metaphor for this is the story, and this isn't probably not a true story, an apocryphal story, but of a, a man who was um, in uh, years ago um, with a, a horse and a buggy, and he's going through town, and it has just rained. And the horse gets uh, the, the the wheels of the um, of the buggy get um, stuck in the um, in in the mud, 
and he tries to get the, the, the wheels out and he can't do it. So the strongest man in town comes along and says, well, let me try. And he tries and he can't do it. And then a, a weaker man like me in town comes along and says, you know, I think I can do it. Um, and everybody laughs at him. And he says, uh, it, but he gathers around 20 or 30, um, you know, uh, other men and women. And together they all get the, the, the horse and buggy uh, free. And so when we're working together, um, and and you and we know how to work together without not listening, without um, putting each other down, without making our difference differences paramount, but finding out how we can respect each other. Um, that that is the formula for um, for winning. And would you say parenting is maybe the one of the highest expressions of that uh, together in a stable two parent family? Yes. Now, the parenting parenting is absolutely one of the um, the most useful <laughs> methods of winning, and also yeah. the, one of the clearest examples of why we're not winning. Uh, so, there's two major things happening in parenting. One is um, when I when I was doing the research for the boy crisis, uh, what I found was that the uh, the boy crisis resides where dads do not reside. So, I started thinking back from that. Well, why don't dads reside? Um, in many families. And it was um, because of, in, in the group that had been married, it was because of divorces. And after divorces, there was a minimal amount of father involvement. And you know, we know, we all know, if you're listening to this podcast, that the divorce courts are enormously biased against men. But even take away that bias against men for a moment and go to the next level and say, well, why are couples divorcing? And for the most part, the couples were divorcing because they didn't feel heard by their partner. Um, they brought something up and their partner became defensive. So they stopped bringing things up because every time they did, it only escalated and got worse. Um, and so I began to see that the Achilles heel of all human beings is our inability to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. And so I said, is there a way around that? So I started researching that and seeing that there, um, that historically speaking, if you um, heard criticism, it might be from a kinship network or a neighboring tribe. The fear was that that might be uh, the sign that that um, kinship network or tribe was going to be a possible enemy and it's going to attack you. So it was functional for survival to get up our defenses. So built into our psyche is a need to detect the slightest little nuance that might be a hint of negativity being covered up by some polite diplomacy. And so, you know, when, when we hear something even positive and it has that little nuance of negativity, we hear the butt train coming around the mountain and we start preparing ourselves. And so the, um, the, the, the propensity is to become defensive or to kill the enemy before the enemy kills you. And so the, um, yeah. And so, and so, therefore, no one that loved each other felt safe saying what they, they, their concerns were that would appear to the person who was hearing them as a criticism. And, and so they started to get further and further apart from each other. And that ultimately led to, <laughs> to divorces. And that ultimately led to children having minimal or no father involvement, or what I call dad yeah. deprivation. And that dad deprivation... Um, is is where um, the is is what it leads to girls and boys most doing worse. I found when I did the research for the boy crisis, in more than fifty areas of development, more than fifty areas of development, both boys and girls. The main difference between boys and girls is that the the developmental levels, the the impact negatively on boys from a lack of father involvement was much more significant, much more significant in terms of, of committing suicide, taking drugs, feeling un, not understood, withdrawing into video game addiction, withdrawing into porn addiction, um, withdrawing into alcohol, gambling, um, gangs, um, ISIS, um, um, dr dealing drugs, destructive behavior, um, was much more likely to manifest at a more intense level uh, for boys now, than it was for for girls. Would you say that that lopsided effect, it's negative for both boys and girls, you're saying, um, I believe that a thousand percent. Would you say it's a negatively affecting boys even worse because they lack a same-sex parent to model after? As like a That's, role model? Yes. 
I think for starters, it is that they lack a same-sex parent and exactly they don't know who they are as a boy. Second, we give girls a lot more permission to express feelings. And yeah. so, um, and mo and moms are very much more protective. And so, uh, as a rule. And so when a girl is upset, she cries and the mom sees that she cries. And because she's a mom and she's been a girl that's yeah. exact same age, she gets it. Um, and so you she can never it firsthand. Was she, exactly. That's what I mean by she gets it. She, yeah. she remembers that her own experience is like that. And, you know, the girl is, uh, you know, um, feeling like, oh my God, I'm a disgrace. I have some blood that's happening. What is this disgraceful thing? I can't tell anybody. And mom sort of almost, she can intuit all the little, um, the nuances of things that um, that she did when she was a girl to cover up the quote, disgusting blood that she was getting that was called her period. Yeah. And so she picks those things up like that. Yeah. Whereas um, the equivalent for a boy of, you know, masturbating or something like along those lines or needing or wanting to watch porn is not something that she had that drive for um, that she, that, that a boy has. And so, um, so that's, so that's level number one. N number two is that the, the boy without a dad experiences two types of voids. One is a dad void and the other is a void in postponed gratification. Um, mm. As a rule, moms um, and moms set more boundaries. And remember, all these things can be reversed with different moms and dads. Um, moms set more boundaries. Dads enforce boundaries more. So, for example, moms and dads will pretty much both say, um, sweetie, you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. Moms will be slightly more likely to say that. But, yeah, it's pretty much similar, very similar. Um, the children will almost invariably try to have as few peas as possible <laughs> before they have their ice cream. And the difference comes not in the boundary setting so much um, and not, not in the boundary testing, but in the boundary enforcement. Mm -hmm. If there's a divorce, let's say there's a divorce and uh, the child is, you know, wanting to have a, um, um, his ice cream before he finishes his peas. Mom is likely to say something like, oh, sweetie, you know, I did say you should have your, um, finish your peas before you have your ice cream. So I'll tell you what, have this many more peas. And maybe she takes a, you know, a, a knife and uh, separates out half the peas. And the, the child is realizing, aha, uh -huh, okay, I am mom, can, I can negotiate with mom. Okay, so now I have half of that half. And I say, mom, you know, I've had a really bad day at school. You know, Jimmy tried to bully me again. Um, you know, and mom says, oh yeah, that's terrible. And, you know, and also there's, you know, we're divorced. He must feel like, you know, lonely that he hasn't seen his dad for a while. Okay, and I'm not gonna get into a big argument over a few peas. That's insensitive and ridiculous. It's of wrong priorities. Okay, sweetie, I understand. Um, I'll tell you what, just have, um, you can have your ice cream now. Whereas dad is more likely to say, um, you know, sweetie, um, you, I, I said, you can't have your ice cream till you finish your peas. Oh, dad, you're so mean. Mom lets me have it. You know, he isn't like that to me. Well, he, uh, your dad's house, this is dad's rules. Um, and gets all upset. You know, sweetie, you can continue crying and, and yelling at me like that. And then there'll be no more ice cream tomorrow night either. And now the kid sees where it's going. Uh, it's only going to get worse if she, or she or he complains, and there's not going to be a deal that dad's going to make. And so um, the the child says to the um, so the child with the dad is much more likely, and this is the key, with dad, the child is more likely on focusing on focusing on doing what she or he needs to do, finish the peas, before they get what they want to have, the ice cream. And the ADHD level among uh, children living primarily with dads is only 15%. The ADHD mm -hmm. level with children living primarily with moms is 30%. Wow. Twice the level. And one of the reasons you can see in that example is that with the dad, the child learns that there's no benefit in not learning how to finish your peas. That is, postpone gratification um, and doing the thing you don't want to do in order to get what you want to have. Whereas with mom, the child is much more likely to become manipulative, coercive, uh, exhaust the mom. Um, and so you hear mom saying how overwhelmed they are and having she has to repeat things over and over again because the last time she said something, he was able to manipulate a better deal. So when she says something, she he only goes back to manipulating. And that's just one of 
a dozen examples that I, when I researched, did the research for the boy crisis that I found are differences in dad style parenting versus mom style parenting that yeah. lead to children doing so much better when they have a combination of both style parenting because moms are very much more likely to be protective. They're much more likely to say, sweetie, you know, you sang that really nicely. You could be a singer. Do you know that you could really be a singer? Um, but with, um, but unless the children have the discipline, the dream of becoming a singer cannot be followed through with the discipline that it takes to do anything artistic well. You have to be in the upper 1% to be able to survive and prosper doing that. And so um, that's just an example of um, some of the things that, uh, uh, to address your original question, which is, yeah. don't parents work well together? And yes, my findings for the boy crisis were that, that the children who do best have a, what I call checks and balance parenting. Um, mm -hmm. That it is a balance between the mom's protector instinct and the dad's um, set disciplines and forced boundary instinct, tough love instinct. One of the big differences is the misunderstandings, feeling that moms have unconditional love, <laughs> dads don't. That is not accurate. Moms and dads both have unconditional love. Dads just have more conditional approval which is part of their unconditional love. Got it. My my follow-up question to this, uh, hearing you talk all the way through this example of the story, right? The peas and everything, and now the follow-up. Uh, what do you think some of the, or do you have, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on the primary driver for those differences in parenting instincts? Testosterone, for example, comes to mind for me because in my, in my understanding, men have much higher testosterone levels than women. Uh, you know, across the spectrum. Is that one of the drivers uh, for and, that? Actually, I'm sorry, your um, your voice is, um, was coming through muffled and I couldn't hear yep. you, what your question was. Um, is it let, uh, voice clear now? That is clear now, yes, thank you. Oh, yep. So my question is, uh, what are the, what do you believe some of the top uh, drivers are for that difference in parenting style? Specifically, you're saying instinctually that mothers and fathers parent differently and that they work together. Mm -hmm. With fathers, though, you're saying that there's more discipline involved, there's more delayed gratification. Uh, for example, is testosterone uh, being higher in men, is that a driver for why that's happening and why women are engaging in different uh, parenting styles? For sure. And all, all of uh, and part, part it's, is the survival thing that uh, mm -hmm. dads were, um, both moms and dads historically <laughs> learned that <clears throat> their job was not about thinking about women's rights, men's rights, um, privileges, opportunities, things like that. Um, the world was not based on the patriarchy that we say it was based on. It was based on the need to survive. Mm -hmm. And to survive, we taught both sexes to play roles or both sexes evolved roles that they played because women bore children. Um, we led That led to women raising children. And because men um, raised uh, money or killed animals or provided the, did the, did the creation of the things to, that, that fed the family, um, dads got into that. So we, even throughout animals, animals realize that they, um, that a, a father wild wolf uh, will, will um, train the children to, the, 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 the baby uh, wolves um, to, uh, to go out away from the mother and learn how to survive in the wilderness and take risks and know what risks to take and what risks not to take. Uh, men have always, almost always historically taken the risks outside the home, the risks of being killed. And so um, my father, as I was mentioning before, you know, he was saying, you know, Warren, you may be a good writer, you just can't make a living doing it. And, you know, and, and, um, and I'm gonna teach you at least how to do um, good hard labor. So you're gonna at least know how to do that. I'm gonna teach you to have discipline. So you'll be able to, because you thrive in the world, not on, on your dreams, but you thrive in the world on either the discipline to fulfill your dreams, which only a small percentage are able to do, or you, uh, or the discipline to do what will predictably earn more money, and it will predictably you'll predictably earn more money by figuring out what your talents are, and you know doing your computer science or historically doing you know working as a car mechanic or working sell, as a salesperson selling product X or uh, that type of thing. But you have to first figure out what makes money 
and then within the framework of what makes money and can provide for your family, uh, what are, which of those things you can do the best, not the other, uh, not figuring out what you'd love to do and, and follow your dream. Uh, that's, um, and, you know, and so, whereas moms, you know, seeing the children's um, talents, uh, they want that talent to be nurtured and they're less likely to think about, um, you know, sort of wanting the, the, the idea of, of saying no, um, you you sang that song poorly. Um, you need to do. You, you need to go back and rehearse the a cappella um, lessons that you had last week to in order, order to bring that your notes up. And then the child starts crying. I was trying. Well, I've been working all day. And the mom, seeing the child cry, feels, Oh my goodness, I'm discouraging the child. Whereas the dad feels, I'm teaching the child how to win. Whereas one of the differences in yeah. dad style versus mom style parenting is dads will play much more active games with children. And when I was, um, you know, when our daughter was about 11 or so, and I played soccer with her, you know, when she didn't really focus, um, I would kick the ball uh, through to the goal, even though I could do that every time with her at 11. But I, I saved my kicking the ball past her for when she wasn't focusing or when she wasn't doing something right. Mm -hmm. And she would sometimes start crying uh, because, you know, she, she had the goal scored on her. And for me, that was the way of teaching her how to be better and better. So she lost in preparation for her knowing what she did that made her lose in preparation, therefore, for her becoming a winner. But that does not come naturally to moms. Yeah, what's coming to mind, uh, not only the discussion of winning and all this, what's really coming to mind as you speak is the, the concept of risk assessment and that fathers and mothers are teaching that in different ways. The mother is not is focusing more on the you know the dreams and the aspirations, whether that's art or music or writing, from your own experience with your own father. And then he was focusing more long term on your on risk assessment for you going out into the world and pursuing a career. What was more Absolutely. reliable and lower risk? Absolutely. You, and you see <coughs> exactly this, excuse me. Um, in everyday life with moms and dads, uh, mm. the child might say, um, mom, can I climb the tree in the backyard? And mom will go, well, maybe in a few years, sweetie, but right now you're too young to do that. And you know, so the child runs to dad and says, dad, can I climb the tree in the backyard? And the dad goes, okay, just be careful, okay, sweetie? Yeah. And, um, and so the, the kid goes out to climb the tree and mom says, wait a minute, I just said you couldn't climb the tree. I asked dad, he said, I, said I could. Whoa, yeah. come back here. Dad, what's the, what's this about? I just told just told her or him that um, uh, she couldn't climb the tree. Uh, well, I think she can. They get into a big argument, but the argument is a can be a functional argument if they're both listening to each other. For example, mm -hmm. the dad, the mom can say to the dad, um, you know, all right, we can. Uh, the child can climb the tree, but under three conditions. Condition number one: she or he doesn't go up too high. Condition number two, the branches, um, you know, these branches you can't go on because they're too fragile. Condition number three is you're out there under the tree. So if, if our daughter or son falls, uh, you'll be able to protect them from really hurting themselves and getting a concussion. Um, oh, and number four, give me your cell phone um, if you're going to yeah. go out there so you don't get distracted. And so, yep. and then, so what's happened now? The, the child has gotten the op opportunity to take risks by climbing the tree, but also have protection. And so, interestingly enough, uh, when fathers are parenting children alone, they're far more protective and they, they incorporate the mother role of protective than they are when they're parenting children with, with a mom, where they just expect that the mom will take care of the protection part. That's um, really interesting. And, I've, I've yeah, not heard that before, that the yeah. father will basically, he'll modify his own parenting style with the, in the absence of a mother. Yes, yes, exactly. Not to the degree that the mother does, but to a much greater degree uh, than, than, uh, than normal. And so what, what's happened and here is why it is so important um, that what has happened when that child climbs the tree is that the brain synapses start firing much more quickly about, you know, what branch is going to be safe? What branch is not going to be safe? Can I go up any higher than that? Can I get away with going higher than mom told me I could get, um, could do? Um, and still convince mom that I wasn't violating anything. And so, and, and this increases both psychomotor functioning and IQ. Now, I have never heard a dad say to a mom, 
you know, I really want our children to develop much more sophisticated psychomotor functioning and a higher IQ. You want our children to have a higher IQ too. Here is the way that, here is why climbing a tree at that level um, helps that. Here is why roughhousing, we now know, is associated with an increase in empathy, an mm -hmm. increase in social uh, in uh, assertiveness versus aggressiveness, therefore social skills, and an increase in postponed gratification when it is done with the normal boundary enforcements that dads do that at. Dads don't say those things, and dads don't say those things because even if they read parenting magazines or books on parenting, that's nowhere in the books. And so I yeah. felt it was so ob I felt so obligated to have whole sections of the boy crisis on how dads parent differently than moms and how to combine uh, the best to get that checks and balance parenting. And for, for dads to be able to say, you know, here is the, the relationship of roughhousing to empathy, the roughhousing to social s skills, like um, distinguishing being assertive versus aggressive, and then to say them to moms and not to say them to moms like, I'm right, you're wrong, but to say that to moms like, I, here's what I know you have to contribute. What more do you think you have to contribute? Here's what um, what I've learned that I need to do in order to help the, ch the children develop this type of balance. <clears throat> you want our children to, to achieve that dream of becoming the musician. I want our son and daughter to achieve that dream of becoming the musician. You, you foster that dream and I foster it differently by helping our children have the discipline to become that musician. Yeah, this is fascinating, man, this is fascinating. I was going to add on that, I uh, had a quick qu uh, quip on that, but I can't remember it now. Brain fart. Anyway, we'll move on, we'll move on to my, I have a whole list of questions. When you get to be my age, you'll have more of them, so <laughs> introduction. Yeah. Yep. So let's get into uh, some more of the uh, questions I've written down. So actually not even written down, but we this came to mind right before we started the show. So the title of your book, of course, is The Boy Crisis. And it sounds, from talking to you, there's actually several motivations for choosing that title. Can you talk to me about uh, the top two or three motivations for why you chose that title in the first place with your co-author? Yes. Well, one of the reasons, <clears throat> one of the things I really have discovered over the years is that, um, you know, biologically males were, were chosen based on our ability to protect our willingness to be disposable. So, you know, we, feel, you know, we fall in love with the officer and the gentleman, not the private and the pacifist. Uh, women, you know, women and in doing so, what the woman is falling in love with <clears throat> in that officer and a gentleman is his commitment to protecting, his commitment to being willing to die um, so that um, that the woman can live and that children can live and that others can live. And so we've always historically, every generation has had its war. And in each generation's war, we've historically told boys that at the age of seven, eight, nine, look at Uncle Joe, um, his picture is on the, on the mantle. And he um, he d died in war, war, World War II, um, but he got you know he got to be all the way up to be a colonel, and um, and we're really proud of him. He he, he um, as a result of men like him, we're not um, under Nazi rule. And the boy learns that I can be a hero. I can I can make a difference if I if in the next war I go off and I am I serve. I come back with a uniform. Girls will be attracted to me. Um, parents will respect me. Um, the 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 community will respect me i will be something and even if he's <coughs> not doing you know, well uh, a quick comment um stefan molyneux spoke exactly on this issue of men going to mm -hmm. war and these reasons why and what happens as a result and he got on youtube people just these feminists just went after him for it for saying the exact same things you're saying it was it's just uh mm -hmm. that's just a, a hallmark right now for me that is so sad that is really sad and and yeah. you know one of the things you have to if if you're a man you know, that follows men's issues and care about men, cares about it, men's issues. And you watch this podcast, um, do not do anything with it unless you have, unless you are able to handle criticism yep. because you will receive it. If you love women, which I do, uh, understand that the great majority of women will not be able to hear you. You'll have to listen and listen and listen in, in order to be able to share something lovingly. Um, but, one of the back to your question is one of the motivate one of the differences between the boy crisis and the myth of male power is that in the myth of male power I'm addressing women and men about what happens to men 
women do not have a protector instinct toward adult men. They expect men to sacrifice to protect them. So when women hear men saying, I have a problem too, biologically, what that feels like to a woman is like scratching um, fingernails on a chalkboard. Yep. Women do not fall in love when, when a man complains to a woman that feels like a whining man. Women do not feel fall in love with whining men. They fall in love with alpha men. And here is the dynamic. And so the, the first thing, so with the boy crisis, there's a different dynamic biologically. When I talk about the challenges that boys have, um, women who are mothers, even feminist women who are mothers of sons, um, begin to have the, the instinct to protect the son is there. Mm. And so when she hears something empathetic about the boy's fear of taking a sexual initiative, let's say when he's 14 years old and he's coming to mom and say, mommy, you know, I really love Krista in school, um, but you know, she's really pretty and all the other boys, I'm sure she's more attractive to the other boys than she is to me. And mom sees the vulnerability of that boy and says, sweetie, you're a wonderful, sensitive, caring boy. And maybe Krista's sitting home waiting for a call from you and maybe she likes you, um, but she, you know, she doesn't, she hasn't heard from you. So you need to pick up the phone and call her or talk to her about other things and then get to know her a little bit and have her get to know you. But she's what mom is seeing in that boy is the vulnerability. Whereas if I say men fear taking sexual initiatives with women, when the woman is thinking about adult men, she's thinking, oh, right, fear. I told the guy at, you know, at a bar once, you know, do, do not buy me another drink. I'm, I just, I need to go. And he said, no, 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 here's another drink. I've already ordered it for you, sweetie. And, um, you know, and then he tried to pie me with another drink. Uh, and he, she doesn't say he bought me another drink and I had the responsibility to whether I drank it or not, but says I was plied with another drink, uh, which is victim talk um, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the guy. But the important thing that she's trying to say to us is he was he didn't seem to her to be that sensitive about fearing rejection. In fact, he was fearing rejection. He was just doing all these behaviors that have in the past worked for him about moving the woman from no to maybe to yes, uh, that men find, um, that men do find that when f feminists say that what is there about no that you don't understand? Um, the male experience of that is when women have said no to me before, and then I talk to them a little bit more, I buy them another drink, or I ask again in a different way, or I, or, um, or I give them more coffee to wake them up, or I give them more alcohol to relax them, or I talk more about them, or I talk more about myself. Uh, sometimes um, that no moves to maybe, and sometimes that maybe moves to yes. That's what there is about no, that I don't understand the history of my interactions. But if you say that about men, women have all those overwhelmingly negative experiences that come to mind and they just can't even hear it. If you say that about her son's fear of taking, calling Krista, the, 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 the mom, even the feminist mom, um, has a different experience of the vulnerability that she or he protects. Now, I'm going to go from there to a much bigger picture. Um, okay. Um, on this issue of, of the biological differences. Um, in all animals with three or four exceptions, um, they, from when I say animal, I mean from insect right up to human beings. Okay. Um, about 85% of reproduction happens between the female and the alpha male. And so the so the, the woman is, the female is constantly looking for the male who will best be able to protect her. So let's take buck elks, elks as an example. So the female buck, buck elk will look for the uh, male buck elk who has grown the biggest rack. And to grow that biggest rack, uh, that exhausts 30% of the calcium, the nutrition, and the minerals of that buck elk. So the, the buck elk with the exhausted minerals, nutrition, nutrition and calcium, um, the second he reproduces, if he doesn't get rid of that rack right away by you know, rubbing it against a tree, um, the, um, the, he's likely to die before if the if the winter sets in before he's able to replenish that nutrition. Wow. So the the point there is that the that men's weakness 
is our facade of strength. The buck elk that was the alpha elk with the biggest rack had the biggest facade of strength. The mother reproduced with him because the mother would get the greatest amount of protection from him without regard for whether or not he would die later. Because what she cared wow. about was her being protected and the children being protected. What he cared about was having sex with the, uh, be, being the one to win the sexual privileges with the woman. And the very fact that we call it sexual privileges give us, gives us a hint as to where the power lies. If for him, it's a, it's a privilege for her it's an opportunity to cash in on getting the greatest amount of protection for not just herself, but her children. And this is an instinct that um, surfaces. This is not women greedy, men not greedy. Women are willing to die to protect their children, but they're even happier to find a man who will die to protect them and their children. Yeah. Wow. It's uh, it's interesting that yeah, you you go all the way from insects to elk to human beings, and uh, yeah. you see the, the same behavior. I even I, you might be familiar with it. Maybe about a year or two ago, there was uh, research that came out showing that, like you're saying, uh, most men, human beings, that history have not reproduced. Uh, women, by and large, have reproduced, obviously, but men, it's only a small percentage, maybe thirty percent or something like that. Basically, the alpha males are the ones that reproduce that history, and everyone that, else just correct. got weeded out of the gener I, gene pool. I, and you see this, and uh, you were seeing this. So one of the reasons I'm concerned with the boy crisis is that mm. when boys don't produce well, it's not just that boys are not producing well. Women who are thinking about having children are looking for men who are not living in their, uh, standing on unemployment lines and then going back to their parents' basement and living there and watching video games. They're looking for productive men. They're looking for successful men. They're looking for motivated men. And increasingly, as women provide more income, they'll be looking for emotionally sophisticated and intelligent men who can both express feelings, know how to, to, to work with people, know how to work with children. And so, uh, and so when, when boys lose, girls lose. And when girls lose and boys lose, the children lose because they only end up having one parent. Um, mom say, you know, I'm, I'm the, the selection of men that are out there uh, that are attracted to me, that I'm attracted to, um, they're, you know, that the, 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 the 5% that are the winners um, and that are, you know, taller than I am and that are relatively good looking, um, they're, uh, they, they seem to be attracted to other women or they're gay or, you know, but I'm not getting them. So rather than having to compromise with a man, I'll raise a child by myself. And so what the woman doesn't realize is that particularly if she has a boy child, but also if she has a girl child, um, that that is a high risk operation. There are millions of children raised by single moms that do quite well, um, but, uh, and some that do very well. But it's a little bit like putting your child in a um, in a in a car drunk um, in San Francisco and asking him or her to drive drunk to New York. The chances are fairly good that they'll get they'll get there safely, or have yeah. a, just a minor minor accident. But you're increasing the risk. And so what you know what I found at the beginning, um, and when I was in the board of Now in New York City, I first began to see some of this data in the 1970s. And I brought this up to the now members who were my board members, and they were a little bit disconcerted saying, well, wait a minute, if you're saying dads are so important, that means we're not gonna have give women the free choice to raise children by themselves or the free choice to make a decision as to who the, who the children should be with um, when, they, um, when there's a divorce. And I said, well, isn't our mission here to make sure that we have better children if a mom you know, becomes um, pregnant and uh, has a child? And they went, our, our primary mission here, Warren, is that we give women freedom of choice and let we trust women to make that decision the way they feel is best for the children. And let and me so guess, that, how, how dare you advocate one position over the other? Because that's, that, that's, that's yeah. yeah. I've noticed this as well, that they always, feminists always want to present things as an equal choice or this the choice is priority, but behind that, there's hidden uh, there's hidden agendas, and it yeah. sounds like you're just, it sounds like you agree that women do have a choice, but you're advocating for what is you know based on the data and based on facts a better choice to you know, to parent household. Yes, actually, I'm saying women have a choice, and I'm also uh, but I'm saying their choice is at a slightly different level than the feminists were saying it. Um, I was saying that 
I will always fight for and support women's choice to have children. But the second that a woman makes a choice to have a child, that choice involves, when you have a child, a responsibility to put the child's interests first. And so if, the, if we now know that the data shows so clearly that children do better when they have both parents and both parents doing checks and balance parenting, and that moms don't feel so overwhelmed uh, yeah. when they have, when they have um, uh, uh, um, a father working with them to raise the children, and that, um, and that dads, when they have a role in the child rearing process, feel fulfilled, feel that they have purpose. This is one of those few things in life where it's all win, 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 or lose, lose, lose. Yeah. When, there, when there's not a father in the operation, everyone loses. And especially when I was um, between marriages, I was married for um, more than a decade and then had a 20 year period where I wasn't married. And now I've been t together with my wife for 26 years. And um, in between that time, I dated almost all single moms. And wow. the uh, and I loved their their uh, the kids and got along with them real well, um, but I began to see that the um, that that the single moms um, had two words that they said most frequently. The first one was love, the second one was overwhelm. Almost yeah. not almost that's not true. Every single mom I met, with zero exceptions, used the word overwhelm a great deal, like saying, and it was often like. Oh, you know, Warren, I really feel I could do better at, at work and, and you know move up in my career, but I, I don't want to be irresponsible to my uh, my son or my daughter. I love them more than I love my work. And so, but on the other hand, I feel I could do, you know, I want to take my children on trips. I want to take them places that are special uh, to Disneyland, to to Oregon, to, uh, to, you know, to explore this or explore that. Or, you know, we read something about it in the newspaper. I want to be able to be free to take them off there, but I can't with without sacrificing my job and the job is what feeds them. Yes, I get some child support, but it's not enough to really to bring the children up the way I want. I just feel so taxed, so overwhelmed all yep. the time. Um, and so I don't want women to go through their life being overwhelmed, having to make sacrifices on their jobs versus their children. And the best way not to do that is for, for um, having a good father in your life. But in order to have a father in your life, that is good and the type of father that's worthy of you and that your children, we need to pay attention to the boy crisis. Uh, what's happening to boys and why it's happening to boys and particularly to understand that the boy crisis ironically resides where fathers don't reside. Yeah. So what you're saying, and I, if I can articulate it uh, in my own way here correctly, is <laughs> that you know women, mothers suffer when they try to play two parents rather than one parent as a mother, yes. they try to play mother and yeah. father I've heard this too, by the way, in my own generation. There's a lot of single moms in Central Florida. Um, mm -hmm. I know more more than I can count. And they say basically the same things you're saying. It hasn't changed uh, from my generation. Yeah. Yeah. My question, though, is this, this came to mind when you were speaking. Is And I haven't seen you. Uh, maybe, maybe I missed it. But do you have thoughts on basically not only the role of two parents in raising a child and the benefits for that that are immense? Do you have thoughts on the masculinity or the the male role of uncles and grandfathers and extended family and mm. parenting or not parenting, but contributing to, uh, you know, say a boy's life growing up. I recently became an uncle myself about uh, eight months ago. Mm. I have a little nephew now. It's amazing. I love it. Um, but I haven't heard a lot of discussion about that. Even the men's community, it's mostly, and I, I like that. It's, you know, a lot of discussion, fathers, mm. uh, boys and men and the, their rights and the issues, but you don't hear so much about uncles and grandfathers and extended family like that. Um, do you have any work on that or uh, discussion? Yes, there's a fair. Uh, there's two things in the um, boy crisis book that deal with that that a lot. First is the the chapter on what can a single mother do. So you know the first thing I yeah. explain is first you need to value the different parenting styles of of men versus women until you understand the different parenting styles of, of dads and what that leads to. Um, you will not be able to help a man see that he's valued, see that he's needed, and you will give uh, you will give gatekeeping signals, um, uh, you know, about um, 
you know, the father that lets the child climb the tree, the father that lets the child go to a um, to a pickup game at school and gets into a fight with some of the kids that they pick up the ga um, game with, the mother will experience that as being um, irresponsible. So if you don't understand those differences and how they contribute to the child's positive development, you will not incorporate a stepfather well, a grandfather well, an uncle well, a male mentor well, you'll always be suspicious, you'll always be limiting them, and you'll always be um, getting less than you can um, out of them. And so that's the first, that's step number one. So um, master those differences and communicate the value of any man you're involving in your child's life um, with, um, with that. Second, if you are a single mom and you, and, and with all that I've said, um, you cannot persuade the father to be reinvolved, um, or the father is so irresponsible or is in prison um, and can't get out. Uh, the the um, then move to a number of other options. Number one is look for a sport that your child may be good in. If she or he is um, fairly good in a sport, um, start helping them get the discipline to be better at that sport and then get them involved in that sport, especially a team sport, but watch out for who the male coach is. So if you have a couple of different sports that your kid is good at, but the, but the coach at school is more empathetic and connected and, and has a reputation for really guiding boys, not caring so much about winning, but caring about every boy on the team developing, um, pick, you know, encourage your child to go to that with that sport. When I was raising my daughter, my daughters didn't, uh, with our daughters, um, our daughters didn't want to play um, a, a, a soccer or any sport at all. And I said, um, I was a stepfather, and I said, um, you know, you don't have an option. You you can have an option as to which sport you can choose, um, but you don't have an option to not play the sports. And they finally did choose a sport, but only because mom finally got on board on that issue of uh, the children choosing a sport. And it was one of the best experiences of their, of their growing up years. Um, but it sometimes takes a parent being very um, strict about that. So here's some of the, here's, here's two things you can do. Uh, I'm gonna give you two lists of things you can do if there's a divorce. Um, number number one is there's a chapter in the boy crisis called the four must do's of divorce, and briefly the four must do's are that there's about an, there's an equal amount of fathering and mothering uh, that the ch the children have um, after divorce. Number two is that the children do not hear any bad mouthing from father to mother or mother to fa uh, father. Number three is that the children live the par the parents live within about 20 minutes drive time from each other because if they don't the children don't want to go over to the other parents home and miss the soccer practice or miss the um the birthday party of a friend and it takes them away from their social connections and and what they learn from sports and number four this is the most recent finding is that the children who do the best are the ones whose parents are in continuing and the emphasis is on the word continuing relationship counseling or communication counseling. So don't just go to counseling when you have a fight over something that's an emergency, because the emergency often means a deadline, and it doesn't mean it means that you don't have the time to understand the other one's best intent. So you make accusations about why the other person is wrong, and you don't hear the, hear them out. The, um, and when you go to um, long-term counseling, you um, it, it, as little as once a month, you will find that your children will not just benefit uh, from the two of you doing better uh, with each other, but realizing that they're not so afraid of marriage because marriage will end up with a divorce that yeah. will end up with the parents bickering and you're teaching your children how to communicate. When, when my daughter, uh, stepdaughter had her first significant problem with a boyfriend and they came to me and I, um, and I was working with them on that, um, my stepdaughter interrupted me and says, that's what you and mom do. And then that's what you and mom do. And she never, I never even know that she noticed that before. But as soon as it was articulated for her, it became yeah. very clear to her that that's, you know, that's, so the role modeling is very important. Sounds okay. Like by example, basically, and actions speak a lot of the words, you know? Yes, example. And then also, if I were to have done that better, um, I would have done some more good work around family dinner nights to make sure that I articulated what was happening, um, as well as ha had that just be discovered um, on, on an unconscious level. The next thing is if 
it's absolutely impossible to get a, um, a, a, good, a good man involved at, that, at, a, at a biological father level, then uh, you must know how to work with a stepdad if you have a stepdad involved. Uh, there's the, most stepdads become advisors. You want to make sure that you value the stepdad's involvement enough, the, father, the stepfather's way of parenting, to know that his likelihood of having a tough love approach to your children has is very valuable to balance your love love approach to to the children, mm -hmm. and so don't just make him an advisor. Understand his reasoning and incorporate it at, with an equal amount of influence and power. Otherwise, you waste the the stepfather, grandfather. Grandfather, it's, uh, grandfather and grandmother are very important to get involved. Uh, and grandfather can be very helpful, but under, but explain, understand the differences between grandfather's values from his generation and the values that you want to create for your generation. For grandfather, a frankfurter may have been just fine. Uh, for you, maybe the frankfurter doesn't have the nutrition that you want. Um, but how to communicate those differences are, are very important. Next, get your children involved in Cub Scouts. The high, the Cub Scouts have done a lot of work on developing character. Children that are involved with Cub Scouts, boys, uh, boys that are involved in Cub Scouts for two years or more consistently, have a, a marked, measurable increase in character development. Get them involved in Boy Scouts. If you're inter, if you're a faith-based person, get them involved with your minister, your priest, your rabbi, uh, your imam. And, um, and but make sure that minister, priest, rabbi, or imam uh, is a responsible, caring per, um, man, and make sure that he gets the, your your son together with other boys his age, where they talk confidentially about their feelings and what's going and their fears and what's going on in them, because boys tend to stuff their fears and their feelings, and then hide behind a mask of masculinity and um, feel that they have to appear strong when in fact they're feeling extremely weak. Uh, like the buck elk that we were talking about, men's weakness yeah. is our facade of strength. And so uh, make sure that we, um, that you, you, that you do that involvement. Make sure you get your children involved, not just in sports, but look at the chapter on the liberal arts of sports, the three different types of sports that develop a well-rounded boy or girl, by the way, that one applies to both sexes, but or, um, look out for a male mentor. Invite that male mentor over for dinner. Read the section of the boy crisis on how to construct family dinner nights so that they don't become family dinner nightmares. Get the... Um, um, you have a lot of good things in the book like that. Um, a little clever, clever things like that. Another one I heard too is you said that mothers... Uh, God, what was it? Mothers uh, mothers have a right to their children. Fathers have to fight for their children. Yes. Have a divorce one, of the court. Very, one of the very yeah. sad things is... Um, and every father listening to this who's had a divorce will sort of recognize this, that we are living in a culture now where the basic philosophy is that mothers have a right to children and dads have to fight for children. Yeah. The reason this is such a crime is I do a lot of expert witness work, but almost um, helping the judges understand the importance of fathers uh, to the mm. children and the importance of fathers with mothers to the children. Um, but I have to tell you that the... Um, the people who call me, they've spent an average of seventy to seventy to hundred thousand dollars before they've called me, and then the cost of me, their lawyer, often sometimes they have to pay for the mother's lawyers. It means that if you don't have between one hundred and fifty thousand and a quarter million dollars, you don't have much of a chance of 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 having an equal amount of time with your children in most states except for Kentucky, um, and and that's really. Is Kentucky the one state with uh, equal shared parenting, something like that? Yes, yes. There's a problem with uh, a couple of problems with the law, but for the most part, it's uh, the fairest law uh, in yeah. the nation on that issue. Um, and so, uh, we, would you so say we that law to... should be an example for the other states to model after? Yes, with with the one exception that I'm talking about, and it's too technical to get into it here. But okay. um, but yes, do take a look at the Kentucky law, and that is um, the closest to um, a model that uh, for the future. For sure, nice. but you know the the basic model is that is very simple, which is you know when a, when children um, uh, when there's a divorce, um, you know f first of all there needs to be 
I think, a requirement on the part of the courts that the parents, before they, um, the, the judge gets involved, um, gets involved not with a mediator, but with a couple's communication counselor. So the couple learns how to understand and communicate with each other. Mediation is just resolving the differences in who wants what and what type of times and schedules. That's just the mechanics of it. The real good work needs to be done by good communication first to see if you can restore your marriage and if you can't to restore the way you communicate about the differences after marriage. Um, and so th that's the, um, and then once that is done, <clears throat> that the law reads that children have an equal amount of time with both parents, that the parents live within about 20 miles from each other, uh, that there's no bad mouthing. And, um, and when there is a violation of the bad mouthing, if one is doing it, uh, violating those things or doesn't want the other parent involved, that's the sign for the judge to have the primary parent be the one that is facilitative of the other parent's involvement. Wow. Yeah, this sounds great. And it's, uh, I guess the reason we don't have it is because it sounds way too reasonable. You know, default. It's, I mean, it, it's. It is. It I mean, is. Uh, I wish I could agree. I wish I could disagree with you. So, and yeah. and the the long part of the to end that thing is. So yes, every one of these fathers realizes that, you know, the mothers have the right to children, and we dads have to fight for children, and that's the ultimate lose lose situation. Yeah, you mentioned the money issue as well, and it. You know, I've heard this as well. I know guys who've gone through this stuff. Guys who've lost. They fought through, you know, family court like that. They've spent fifty thousand guys, I know personally, and, and more. And then divorces, of course, can get even much nastier than that, uh, losing money there. Oh, yeah, it's, it's the, the money issue though is amazing because most Americans don't have even a few months of savings saved up. Never mind a hundred thousand dollars laying around. Exactly. And then the, the the fathers that do. So what I feel badly about is, you know, here I am working with. You know, that upper that one percent of fathers that have that money to be able to afford all these lawyers and to do the fight and you know whereas the children growing up poor, in poor families uh they're the ones that need the fathers as much or more than the yeah. children growing up in wealthy families and and, uh, and wealthy neighborhoods with good schools etc and yeah. so this is this is really a crime and we're paying uh, when i did the calculation of the cost for this for the um for the boy crisis book I calculated more than a, a trillion dollars a year is what I it saw costs that. To, to repair, yeah. to re clean up the mess of much greater likelihood of these boys um, being able, being criminals and the 700% increase in the prison population since 1970, the cost of maintaining prisons. I looked at the mass shooters and the school shooters. They're almost all dad deprived boys. Yep. Looked at the um, ISIS recruits. Uh, they're almost all, all dad deprived boys. Um, and so when you look at dad deprivations, um, cost, the cost of cleaning up the mess of uh, Homeland Security with ISIS, the Patriot Act, the, you know, the, um, the cost of prisons, the cost of, um, of, of all of these uh, ramifications of the school shootings, the uh, security systems, et cetera, to say nothing of our psychic insecurity and, and shame. Uh, and there's also is, a lost opportunity, right? Because these boys are not productive. You know, they're not building businesses. They're not building careers. They're not paying, you know, making money and paying taxes. So there's a lot of opportunity there too, right? They're soaking our taxes, not paying our taxes. Yeah. Well, uh, we're getting pretty far in the interview. Um, before we wrap up uh, at some point, I do want to go on some current events. So you actually put out a, here we go, an opinion piece uh, in the Washington uh, Examiner's a couple days ago. And rediscovering fatherhood in the plague year. Uh, you guys can Google this, and we'll put a link in the uh, comments or description after the show. And you actually talk about, you know, fatherhood, uh, you know, the importance of it this year, as well as uh, for you know the riots and things going on right now. Can you talk to me about the uh, the importance of fatherhood for you know the protests and the riots going on currently in America, or its relevance to that? Yes, absolutely. We, we are, you know, we're all in agreement that Black Lives Matter, and some of us really are passionate about that. And, um, and yet we're missing a couple of very important parts of the conversation. The most important part of which is that um, if we really care about Black lives, we have to remember that the African-American community is the community that suffers most from dad deprivation. When the Moynihan Report was done in 1965, um, Moynihan was, uh, worked for both Nixon, Johnson, and Kennedy, and was a labor secretary and a sociologist and a U.S. senator. 
um, and he was one of the most respected people in, in, um, in politics. And so he was assigned to do the Boynihan Report to find out why crime had increased so much in inner cities. So he did this and everybody was afraid, like, oh my God, he's gonna find out that you know African-Americans are you know, inferior, they're, they're more prone to, um, to commit crime. We found out something very different, which is that the crime was committed almost always in among families in which there was um, no father involvement, um, usually unmarried families. And it was so, and at that time in 1965, only 25% of children growing up in African and in inner cities were growing up in without dads. Today, the figure is not 25% anymore. It is 74, 75% of yep. African American children are growing up without dads. Interestingly, in the Caucasian community, at that time, 1965, the percentage of Caucasian children growing up without dads was 3.1%. Now it is 35%. It's a 12-fold increase in Caucasian children growing up without dads. And, yep. the, and, the, and the crimes in Caucasian families have increased enormously as well. This as is well true as, basically across across all races and demographics in America, right? Single motherhood yeah, skyrocketed. Yeah. It's, it, it has skyrocketed enormously. And so what yeah. we see, what, what Moynihan saw was where the lack of father involvement increases, your crime increases. Um, where father involvement, um, where father, where father involvement increases, crime decreases. And it's not just crime. Crime is just a symptom, of course, of uh, you know a boy who's purposeless, who's depressed, whose testosterone is not being channeled well. And so the point here is that if we really care about black lives, rather than fo uh, not rather than, but in addition to focusing on the systemic racism that involves the police, we need to focus on the systemic sexism that keeps fathers out of the family um, and get get fathers more involved and recognize that um, the the systemic racism is not equal male to female it is it is the males that are 25 times as the african-american male that is 25 times as likely to be in prison according to the bureau of justice statistics um, as the african-american female it's a huge gap it's the white, um, it's, it's the African-American male, male versus female um, that, is, um, that is also 20 times as likely to be stopped by police, um, shot by police. And so we, we need to look at why, what's happening particularly to dad deprived males and to focus on the, the, the um, rejuvenating our black male boys with father involvement and saying to black fathers, African-American fathers, we need you. Your sons need you. Your daughters also need you. Yeah. Your wife needs, we, wife needs you. And the government needs to stop making it, make, to, to reverse the incentives, to make sure that, uh, that, that women who are poor that live with the father get the income to a greater degree than women who are poor who do not live with the father. Um, and so the um, we need to support families. We need to support those families when they go to communication counseling and they do the work to learn how to be good communicators with each other and therefore good checks and balance parents. For the viewers as well, uh, I wanted to pull up another article, exactly what you are just uh, speaking on. This is another article you put out, uh, an opinion piece, I believe, with Town Hall. And the actual title, of course, like you were speaking on, is If Black Lives Matter, Black Dads Must Matter. And like I mentioned before we went live, uh, I saw Stefan Molyneux tweet uh, the other day, hashtag Black Fathers Matter. And, uh, you know, hitting on a lot of the same topics and points you're speaking on. Paul Elam as well pointed out, um, he actually was reviewing the Black Lives Matter website. And he made a point that they actually don't mention fathers at all. Um, they, it's, it's unfortunate and sad. But so they mentioned a little bit about family stuff. A lot of it's actually they want to get rid of the nuclear family. But they mentioned mothers and parents and fathers. Black fathers is completely omitted. There's no mention of it. This is this is absolutely accurate. Now the yeah. the overall Black Lives Matter movement is a very different sort of spirit 
than the people that created the Black Lives Matter website or the original organization, which is much more radical, much more anti-nuclear family. They're all um, feminists, uh, I believe, right? All uh, three of them. Uh, yes, but in addition to that, it is really a very anti, it, it is very like fathers don't matter uh, website implicitly because fathers on the website are not discussed in any way of, of inclusivity. Yeah. This is the huge mistake. Um, I, I am, I, I chair, as you know, a coalition to create a White House Council on Boys and Men. And um, I've always been, um, I'm, I've been more politically liberal growing up than and, and now for the most part uh, than, than um, conservative. But um, the conservatives are the ones that really understand father's issues and men's issues and then the importance of the family. And I went out, but I went out to work with the, um, ah, you're putting them up there. This yeah. is, um, I interviewed some 10 um, Democratic presidential candidates a year ago, April, uh, when they were in Iowa and had, um, and I found that uh, seven of them have, those interviews are on my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in seeing the actual interviews, they're on uh, you know, the YouTube, my YouTube channel. And so, nice. and they're being flashed right here now. Um, but the, the important thing here is that the Democratic candidates were able to hear me on the importance of fatherlessness and the importance of what's happening with boys, but their campaign managers were very persuasive in persuading the candidates not to speak up about that because they felt that if the candidates did speak up about that, they would lose their feminist base, they would lose their female base because what they were supporting wow. was women's choice to be able to raise children by themselves. And today in the United States, 53% of women under 30 who raise children raise them by them uh, without, without um, being married and usually without father involvement except for a few years. Um, and, the, uh, and so there is this enormous um, propensity to uh, for the for the campaign managers to say some version of no, where we want women to have freedom of choice to be able to be the ones to have the children to, the right to children after uh, marriage. We think that women know the children best, and this was like, um, yeah, and so the, the the ultimately except so much for, for uh, so much for equality. Yes, and so you know, liberals, we are handling we are handing the you know the the next election over to president trump because there are millions of million if you if so if if you feel like you would not like to have president trump um as the next president you need to get your act together when it comes to um caring about boys and caring about fathers and, and incorporating them that freedom of choice is not is 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 the decision you can make to have a child, but you make a decision to have a child, your obligation is to think of what's best for the child, not what, what's best for your freedom to go off and marry another man and move out of state and have the child not see the biological dad uh, very often. And I was gonna, I think I heard you say, just to clarify, were you saying that Andrew Yang was the, the most responsive out of the Democratic yes, candidates to it? Yes, in fact, um, listening to the interview with Andrew Yang is um, very helpful, and he did manage to get one or two sentences out in one of the debates about um, you know the challenges that are happening with boys. Um, wow. And he was, and John Hickenlooper was very receptive with me. You can see a, a full interview I did with John um, on the YouTube channel as well. Um, but uh, when push came to shove, um, he backed off from uh, making a statement about that, hmm. uh, even in his Senate campaign uh, now. So. Uh, that and that's very sad, sad because, because he's yeah. a good man who understands these issues, but he doesn't want to lose his democratic base. Yeah, that's tragic. Um, speaking yeah. on the White House uh, councilmen and boys, I wanted to ask you about that more directly. And you've been all over the news with that Fox News, and like you're saying, you know, the TEDx talk you did on it, and all these things. Uh, you've been working on the the White House councilmen and boys for over ten years now, because uh, you were initially yeah. invited to uh, help form one for uh, women and girls, and then you got yes. this one going as well now. Or how's yeah. the progress on this uh, going? Um, very good in many respects. Um, so um, I was at the White House. Uh, s somebody from the um, Trump administration discovered me talking about father's issues at one of the fatherhood summits. And I got invited to the White House and they had 14 uh, people from the White House Department of Justice and HHS sit with me. And I talked with them about the importance of fathers. They were very excited about it. And um, they asked me to construct a presentation that President Trump would have, um, potentially have given uh, this Father's Day um, on this. And I did um, a presentation, wow. created a presentation for that. 
However, it looks like um, there isn't movement along those lines. The fear seems to be uh, that President Trump talking about family um, would draw too much criticism because of his own three marriages. Yeah. And so um, and he's sort of staying away from that. There is talk about putting um, Pence on this issue and having him speak up on this issue um, because he's, you know, he's so has much more of a solid family background. But so yeah. far that hasn't been done. But we're, you know, we're in the process of developing um, a channel to um, Pence. And um, the, uh, the 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 speech that I created for President Trump to give for Father's Day, uh, which of course we go through speechwriters, so I don't want to give any, you know, any yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, any any illusions here that he'll take my speech and give it uh, for say he'll <laughs> do it in his own words. But, e but even to give something based on what you wrote, that would be amazing for a sitting U.S. president to do that to speak on Father's Day about fatherhood. That would it's be certain, yeah, that'd be amazing. It certainly would, and um, and so you know, so the the pushback that I got from the Democratic candidates and every single campaign manager was so different from the um, receptivity, the, you know, the, the, um, the comments at the White House when I was there was like, you know, wow, we have never heard this at this level of depth. And this is so important. We must do something about it. We just, we have a moral obligation to doing something about it. And yeah. from a liberal looking at, you know, um, at conservatives, you may think moral obligation is something that you have a, 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 the, the only, uh, the only, the only um, could, um, that you have a dominance over or a monopoly over um, moral obligation. But in fact, you know, I, I hope if maybe I communicate anything during this, um, this talk with you, it's that, you know, that both parties care a lot. And both parties have a lot of people that do care. Some that care so much uh, that they think that they that they will do anything to remain in power, thinking that they're the ones that are right. And of yeah. course, um, you know, um, but just um, but you know, uh, I think on the issue of fathers and families, uh, Republicans really get this issue to a much much greater degree. Um, it sounds like the basically the feminists have have I don't know how to explain it. They've pushed the uh, the Democratic Party they've almost forced the candidates away from fatherhood issues. Like you're saying, they, they even if they support it in private, they did it in public, it's gonna, it's gonna cost them getting nominated or getting elected. It's, yes, it's, co yes, it's actually is. costing, there's consequences to it. There's enormous con consequences to it. And, yeah. and one of the consequences is that there's probably about 20 million parents that have children, mostly boys, who are, are fatherless who are boys who are failures to launch, boys who are depressed, boys who are withdrawing, boys who are addicted in one way or the other to the video games, to porn, to um, all the things I mentioned at the outset of the show. And the, um, and the, um, to not, and, and the, those parents, many of them, if one political leader, whether it's Biden or Trump started saying, we need to pay attention to our boys, our boys need fathers, um, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the, the 50 different areas of developmental regression that boys are, are involved in. Those parents, those voting parents, their sons are more important than their Democratic or Republican label. People will vote for the hearts of, what, of, a, of a candidate who is willing to speak up in behalf of their sons um, and behalf of their daughters ultimately um, as well with the father involvement. And so one of the political parties is missing an enormous opportunity here um, by both parties basically ignoring this issue. But so far, I have to give the Republican Party credit for moving much more um, to being much more receptive, facilitative, and enthusiastic about this issue uh, than the Democratic uh, Party has been. Yeah. And so do you think we can, I know it's there, you can't, you don't have a crystal ball, but do you think we can expect in a high likelihood in the coming years an actual White House Council on Men and Boys? Because currently you're still in the commission early phases of it, right? No, uh, 11 years into it. <laughs> 11, and, uh, 11, 11 years, yeah, yeah. Years. I meant um, from my age, that's, a, that's very, very uh, minimum amount of time. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot for me. That's a lot. The third of my yeah, life. I'm, I'm playing with myself and, or mocking yeah. myself, of course. But is it likely to get actually, um, so it's still in the commission phase though, is kind of what I meant. That's not finished it's, yet. It's still, it's, it's still in the coalition phase of, of yeah. it's the coalition to create a White House Council on Boys and Men. 
and there, while there is receptivity to it, um, yep. it hasn't been done yet. And um, the White House Council on Women and Girls, if, you, if you're interested in that journey, uh, you can take a look at the White House Council on Boys and Men we website. But the, the yep. brief version of that journey was um, because I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City, when Obama, uh, President Obama formed the White House Council on Women and Girls, um, I was called by the White House to be on the board of it, uh, an, uh, on an advisory group for the White House Council on Women and Girls. Of course, I said yes. They ended up t turning out that the that, that council was never formed. But at any rate, um, the uh, I said I'm happy to join that and be in the advisory group for that. However. Um, there's a real need for a, a White House Council on Boys and Men as well, yeah. and the woman who called me said, oh, "Well, that's not in my, you know, my, um, I, I don't have the authority to do that. Um, but if you create a proposal, I'll help you um, get it up the um, the ladder." And so I got 34 of the top leaders in the country on boys and men's issues, and you know, the head of the Boy Scouts, the head of um, Men's Health Magazine, etc. And we, um, we, we spent 18 months hammering out because I was committed to making this coalition a multi-partisan coalition, by which I mean Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, and people that were somewhere in you know, mix, a mixture of all. Independence. And, yeah. and, and we, we hammered that out for 18 months, created, I think, a really outstanding proposal. Um, and then I've you know, very, very significantly updated, updated that in the Boy Crisis book. Yeah, I was going to uh, say it sounds like that inspired, or a lot of that ended up ending, ended up in the boy crisis, basically, as an inspiration yes, for it. Um, there's a um, when we did this and 11 years ago, I didn't have nearly the data that we ha I had today because I hadn't done as much research on it. I've only been I've been researching yeah. intensely in the last 10 years. Uh, so we're still, you know, we're pretty far in the interview. Um, before we wrap up, if eventually, uh, I don't think we can end the show without discussing fa uh, Father's Day, which is tomorrow. Yes. And I actually found this article uh, that was published. Um, it was, you know, you were interviewed basically for it by the Tennessean. And I thought it was actually current, but it's actually last year. It's so 2019. And you were speaking on the issue of Father's Day. And you said, you know, the title of this is, they're just as needed as mothers. Warren Farrell thinks Father's Day gets overshadowed. So you're actually a father yourself. You have two daughters, right? Biological daughters. Yeah. No, um, two, two stepdaughters but, uh, from, yeah. from my mom, from my wife. Who's, okay. My okay. wife is the my mistake. Um, but can you discuss to me the, the importance of fatherhood? I mean, other than a president speaking on Father's Day, which would be yeah. stunning. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of, you know, tomorrow, I'm sure on Instagram for the woman my age, you know, millennials and stuff, mm -hmm. I'm going to see a lot of memes and things like that about, you know, mothers do everything and they can be both. And mm -hmm. uh, they'll they'll even celebrate. It's bizarre, you know, being a, be, they're a woman and they'll celebrate being a father in this kind of weird, you know, internet language. Yeah. Yeah. But can you discuss yeah. the importance of Father's Day and how it's treated in, in modern culture? Yeah, well, it's, it's it used to be a father knows best, and now it's fathers know less. Or and so a, a boy growing up is looking at TV and seeing these bumbling, you know, idiots called fathers, um, sometimes yeah. kind and well-meaning idiots, but incompetent. Um, yeah. And you know, he's also hearing that the future is female. This yeah. is not the best formula for um, you know inspiring a boy to think about his future. Um, yeah. The and but what is missing is. You know, um, I was mentioning in the, earlier in the show that boys and girls do worse in more than 50 areas of development when there's not a significant amount of father involvement <clears throat> and, and, and that there's reasons that that um, ends up being the case. One is just having half your genes being the genes of the dad, uh, but the other part is understanding all those differences between dad's greater, greater propensity to discipline, to create the tough part of tough love, um, to do things like um, rough housing that creates bonding with the children, um, but also teaching, but doing boundary enforcement and saying that there will be no more rough housing if you're not considerate of your, your brother's or your sister's needs. Um, children being, um, dads are much more likely to take the children out camping to areas that might be a little bit precarious or let them walk a little further without them right behind them or next to them or holding their hand. Let them get lost for a little while within, this, within, an, within an area of safety. Uh, dads are often like roller coasters, providing a lot of excitement, but with safety um, uh, at, at the bottom of it. But okay, and letting the children get a little bit hurt on the playground, getting into a fight, and then treating the 
that experience of the fight as something that they can talk through with the child as being able to learn how to avoid the fight in the future, as opposed to being there at the playground, protecting them from the fight. Um, dads have a philosophy internally for the most part. And again, some dads are exactly the opposite of this. Some dads are irresponsible and some mothers are exactly this way. Um, and so there's so many differences in dad style parenting that lead to those 50 developmental advances that children with dad involvement have. And so it, it's incumbent upon both moms and dads um, to not be an overwhelmed mom, uh, to involve dads, to call upon our dads. I've asked the White House to create a father's warriors program to train boys from an early age to be involved, caring, emotionally intelligent father, and to work with women to um, and, uh, desire a father as a mate, a father that's involved maybe full-time, while the woman might be full-time involved in um, breaking glass ceilings. Uh, many women say to me, oh, I can't be a have-it-all woman like a man can be a have-it-all man. Um, and that's not true. A woman can be a have-it-all woman if, if, she, if, she, if she chooses a man from among the men that she's interested in. Um, who is uh, more interested in being emotionally engaged, perhaps full time with the children, while she goes out and makes that money that she wants to make and be, be a status success and, and have responsibility in a positive and creative way. And so um, if she can do that while he's home taking care of the children, as long as she respects him for being home and taking care of the children, she can be a habitable woman she can have a career, she can have a good marriage, and she can have successfully raised children. Um, and that's a way of doing it. But you have to value a man's contribution as a father in order to do that. I can just hear the feminist screeching now saying that a mother, you know, a woman need a man and a, and a mother needs a father. Yeah. It makes perfect yeah, sense, though. Yeah. The only way to the only way to do the have it all is to actually facilitate an environment where that's even possible. Otherwise, yes. you just end up overwhelmed and stressed out and anxiety ridden and all that. And you have to be um, a brave woman for that because, um, you know, many times women, if they marry a man whose goal it is to be full time dad and maybe try something experimental uh, when he has time while he's raising the children that may or may not make money, uh, her women friends will often say, well, what about that doctor you dated? You know, why did I introduce you to Jim, the yeah, lawyer? They'll, they'll chirp, um, you know, and chirp. so she'll feel less respected by her women friends if she chooses a man whose specialization is emotional intelligence uh, rather, than, um, rather than economic success. Yeah. One of the issues I want to discuss is you, you focused heavily on the book. Well, first of all, I, I, like I, I promised my wife I'd be um, finished oh. by 9.30 or 10 o'clock. No problem, so, no problem, um, we can wrap up. Maybe, yeah. maybe one, one more question and we'll uh, finish up. Yeah, I guess my final question, well, yeah, let's just end it on this. Uh, this is a kind of wrap-up question I had, and it has gone, we've gone about 90 minutes now. Um, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, you're in your 70s now. I think you're going to live well into your 90s, maybe 100, like I said. Given, and spe based specifically, I'm hopeful, first of all, for your voice to be around for a long time, as long as possible. But specifically in the book, you actually went into physical health, mental health, supplements, nutrition, things that are very consistent with what our speakers at the 21 Convention have advocated for years. Other authors you might know, like Mark Sisson, Dr. Paul Gemini, Dave mm -hmm. Asprey, and people like that. But how do you want to be remembered specifically, um, other than agitating feminists and advocating for boys? Is there anything yeah. more uh, in men, obviously, in fathers? Yes. Um, I, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who basically feels that we're all in the same family boat and that when either sex wins, both sexes, uh, uh, when, it, when only one sex wins, both sexes lose. I'd like to re be remembered as somebody who cares about gender liberation, liberating both sexes from the rigid roles of the past from more, to more intelligent, um, flexible roles for our future. And I'd also like to be remembered for the couples communication work that I do, getting both sexes to listen to each other and to um, facilitate um, the ability of, of each person before they articulate their perspectives to fully hear um, other the perspective of the person that they love, that they live with, whether that's their parents, whether that's their children, to understand how to run family dinner nights um, so that they're really effective in allowing every child to be an emotionally intelligent child. If I can uh, be remembered for those things, uh, that would be my, um, and for being, I hope, a, 
a, a really good husband to my wife and uh, uh, hopefully a good dad to my children. Yeah, sounds good to me. Well, with that said, uh, where can our viewers find out more about you other than links in the description, of course, under the video? And you mentioned you had a workshop coming up as well on Zoom, uh, called a couples counseling. Yeah, I've been um, doing for the last um, week or so. Um, well, actually, last uh, last thirty years, I've been have, I've developed a couples communication workshop that I've been able to um, put on Zoom or get ready to have put on Zoom. That should be available in July and, and or August. And I'd say on the re relation to the boy crisis book uh, that the paperback version on Amazon is the least expensive way of getting it. And the audible version, I have received just overwhelmingly good feedback um, about. I've I've read my, the audible, audible version of the boy crisis, and John Gray has read uh, the ADHD section on the boy crisis um, himself. And um, a lot of both men and women are responding very positively to positively to the audible section. Um, oh, so you both uh, narrated it? I didn't know yes, that. Yes, we, yeah, we we both um, got in the studio. It took me five days to uh, nice. read my part of the book, and. Um, uh, yeah. And John uh, read read his part on ADHD. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Love the interview. Love the content. Love the book. And uh, I'm going to buy more of your books finally. I've been hearing about them for years. The older ones, mm. especially Myth and Male Power and things like that. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your time it's greatly. Really, it's really, a, a, you, you just ask great questions, listen really well. And, Thank you. Um, and, and I like the fact that you care about um, moving these issues forward and you have the guts and courage to do it. Yes, sir. Same to you. Everyone else, uh, you know, appreciate you guys tuning in today live. We'll see you next Saturday with uh, speaker and author Jack Donovan, author of The Way of Men. Uh, Warren, uh, once again, thank you for your time. Everyone, make sure you go buy his book on Amazon now, The Boy Crisis, and many others. Just go on Amazon, search Warren Farrell, and you'll see them all pull up. Uh, thank you, everybody, and we're going to tune total, out. Total pleasure.